This topic is about the BC Investment Corporation. And I think it's really something that we all are quite interested in. Obviously, the topmost in the recent survey we've had, the topmost interest of members is uh, income security and their pension stability. So let's turn to the topic of our pension plan and its financial strength. As you may know, the teacher's pension plan investments are managed by the BC Investment Corporation. We are pleased to have with us uh, Mr. Rob Field, who is the Vice President, Client Partnerships, Corporate and Investment Relation, Investor Relations of the BC Investment Corporation. Rob Field joined BC Investment Corporation in December of 2004, and he is the Vice President of Client Partnerships. He's responsible for the client relations, the client reporting, and the client experience teams. They manage BCI's business relationships and they act as the primary interface with our 32 institutional investor clients, including the teacher pension plan across the province. Rob also serves as chair of the Pension Investment Association of Canada Investment Practices Committee, and he previously chaired the Risk Management Committee during its formative years. He is a CFA, which is a Chartered Financial Analyst. That is one of the highest global distinctions in the investment management profession. He holds a professional accounting designation, the CPA, Chartered Professional Accountant, and he has a legacy holder as a Certified General Accountant. I'd like to welcome Rob Field for his discussion on uh, pension investments. Hi, Rob. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be presenting uh, to the association. And maybe what I'd like to do is just uh, give a bit of a backdrop to speak on investments in general, uh, because it has been without question an interesting uh few years, maybe extending back even uh, to the very start of the decade um, and last sort of three years. So what have we experienced collectively? So March 2020, a global pandemic. We saw um, equity markets at that point uh, drop 30 percent uh, in a very short uh, period, something like uh, 14 days. Governments, central banks did exactly what they needed uh, to protect us all. Uh, and provide fiscal stimulus as well as monetary policy um, and also shut down really the economy for a while for the benefit of our health. People saved during the COVID uh, period um, and what we've seen is obviously the restrictions have eased but obviously news is uh, sort of coming out that we need to introduce uh, maybe some uh, cautious restrictions going into the fall here. Um, but what that really meant as things opened up again all this pent up savings uh, led to a result of uh, increased consumer consumption uh, and really sort of increasing demand for goods and services, which resulted in supply chain challenges uh, that we were all familiar with. So now uh, we've been experiencing very tight labor markets without question, a um, almost unprecedented, not quite, uh, inflationary environment. And again, all driven by pent up demand uh, and higher um, saving le levels than uh, we previously had. And then we've also got um, to add to sort of the, the financial challenges. Vladimir, Vladimir Putin makes the decision to invade the Ukraine. And obviously that pushes global inflation even higher. I say that all just to paint the picture that we're in a period of market uncertainty. The central banks in the face of this in high inflationary environment had to switch gears eventually. A lot of debate, should they have moved quicker or not? But March of 2022, uh, so just last year, interest rates were near zero. Today, they're at 5%. So we had a rapid decline to zero, and then now, uh, two years after COVID, a real sharp increase as central banks globally look to fight inflation. So sounds like a complicated 
complicated environment to be doing investing. It is. But the good news is that your, your pension and your investments are in the good hands of 10 trustees of the teacher's pension plan um, and also a little known organization called BCI, BC Investment Management Corp, the investment professionals that manage your funds. And so that's really um, you know, a quick intro. In terms of the time uh, with you today, I'm gonna touch on and give a bit more background on BCI cover uh, a little bit about um, the teacher's pension plan and then really sort of dive into our ESG strategy, which I understand um, is a specific focus uh, in area of interest. So with that said, I suggest we jump all the way to slide five, if you don't mind. So just at a high level, who is BCI? So we are the provider of investment management services to BC's public sector funds. And so we uh, at BCI in Victoria as the head office, uh, we manage funds uh, for 32 public sector clients, including teachers pension plan. We happen to be one of the biggest uh, institutional investors in Canada. Our organization is part of what's considered um, the Canadian Maple Model, uh, which is recognized globally as uh, for its leadership in pension investing and just pensions in general. Over in Victoria, we're managing over $233 billion for our clients. And one of the key things to mention about our organization is that the Teachers Pension Board has the ability to appoint one director to our board. But also very important is that by law here in British Columbia, um, six of the seven directors that provide oversight of our organization um, have to be uh, representative of client funds. So that straight creates a strong alignment of of interest and influence in our organization. And it really gives, you know, my, from my perspective, it's our clients a sense of ownership uh, in our organization. And that way we've got um, a collective success uh, together. So when we're doing well, when they're doing well, we're doing well and, and likewise. And the number one principle um, in terms of, you know, the, we focus on and think about uh, in regards to our partnerships with clients is being accountable uh, for the, our performance, um, our strategies like ESG and other things, and then just in terms of costs. We operate on a cost recovery model that gives us a significant advantage against the relative to the private sector. So those are some of the highlights. Uh, the organization, uh, 23 years um, as an independent corporation, so over those 23 years, uh, the funds under management uh, have grown from originally about 61 billion to the uh, 233 that you see here on the slide today. Um, another key message, I use the word independent, um, independent from government. And the key reason, one of the key reasons is obviously the assets that we manage belong to others. And so the assets that we manage on the hand on behalf of pension plans like teachers, they belong um, to their members uh, and not the provincial government. And so that independence is very important. So if we turn to the next slide, uh, provide a little bit of context of the types of investments. <clears throat> oh, sorry, our clients. So what, um, pension funds represent 78% of our funds under management. So that's obviously a big focus area for us. One of the areas that have grown is um, to 20% is the insurance funds. And so in terms of the insurance funds that we manage, we manage uh, the accident fund for workers' compensation uh, on, across the province, ICBC uh, in terms of its insurance portfolio, and then a very small uh, insurance bond, well, not small, but... Um, well, not little known, uh, QDIC, which is the Credit Union Deposit Insurance Corporation for all those that are members of a credit union. Uh, so that's our um, sort of a breakdown of the types of funds that we manage. 
But in terms of BCI's footprint, uh, and I guess our client's footprint in the province, in addition to the 725,000 pension plan members uh, reflected here in the slide, um, we are also managing funds for uh, 2.5 million public sector workers in terms of insurance uh, compensation and health benefits. Uh, and then over 3 million drivers in the province because of ICBC, our investment returns are helping the, that we generate and their investment portfolios help to try to stabilize insurance premiums and keep them um, affordable. So that's a bit about BCI's contributions uh, within the province of British Columbia uh, through our clients, really. And it's actually more our clients' contribution. Um, our little part is to generate the income that they need. So turning to the next slide, uh, uh, just some highlights that I want to touch on um, relating to uh, some of our successes. So last year, we generated a return of 3.5%. I'm going to speak a bit more about the 3.5% when I cover um, the teacher's pension return, because it's really very close to this number. Um, but another item that I would highlight, just over uh, the last 20 years, um, BCI has been able to generate over and above market benchmarks what the market has been able to do. So our skill and ability has added close to $20 billion over the uh, last 20 years um, to our clients. So that's a significant uh, contribution. As well, we've been able to invest $4.2 billion in sustainable bonds. So um, funding that helps green projects in terms of addressing climate change, addressing social issues, um, that's really what sustainable bonds are. And then very proud at the very bottom of uh, this slide, you can see BCI, BCE's top employers. So for the fourth consecutive year, not only recognized as one of the top employers in BC, but across Canada. We're very proud of that. Uh, you know, it just reflects our commitment to our staff and our team. Uh, so just jumping to slide nine now, if you wouldn't mind. This is really just a high level um, explanation of what our long-term vision is. And um, in terms of, you heard my title is um, Vice President Client Partnerships. That really is the way that it feels with working together with clients um, because there is that um, sense of ownership. And also they're making a lot of important decisions. We get to do the day-to-day -day stuff but it's the trustees that are making the big decisions in terms of investment strategy, portfolio construction. So uh, in terms of our long-term vision for success, it's really partnerships is the base. Um, we need to create value to generate the income um, to pay pensions long into the future and pay insurance benefits long into the future, and then adaptability, recognizing that uh, the world in which we live in uh, changes and we need to be able to adjust uh, and evolve um, as society and as uh, our environment uh, certainly changes. So that's really what uh, guides us from a long-term perspective. And if we turn to the next slide, um, actually, you know what? Yeah, the next slide's a good one. Um, we have, um, so I've been at BCI 19 years now, and a lot of people say, man, that's a long time, Rob. Uh, but it's really been a, um, a tale of really two different organizations. When I first joined the organization, uh, we were referred to as the BC Investment Management Corporation, sorry, BC Investment Management of BC. Um, and um, when I joined, I think in 2004, we were under 100 employees. Um, in 2014, when Gordon Fife joined as our new CEO, uh, he arrived September 2014, and uh, we were at a headcount of about 200 employees. We have since grown uh, to over um, 730 employees, uh, and the primary reason uh, for that transformation was to be able to do more active investing being able to generate uh, additional value for our clients, manage more of the assets in-house, 
be able to deploy and invest client funds in the teacher's pension fund in private markets, uh, which provide a better risk-adjusted return. Uh, and then also we diversified our public market exposure and introduced uh, a number of new strategies. So that was a sort of a seven year exercise. Uh, we are through the transformation and uh, we hope that our clients are really seeing the benefit. So on the next slide, uh, it's really sort of talking, you know, one area in particular, just that in-house management. So, you know, in terms of just as a reference point of um, the evolution, 2016, uh, we were at 57% uh, managed internally. Uh, we're now at 82.3%. And why does that matter to you uh, as uh, pension plan members? The reason is that external management um, is three to seven times more expensive than internal management. That was kind of a message that Gordon shared early on in his arrival. Um, what we have seen uh, in the last seven years is that for certain asset classes like private equity, the actual savings is more like 10 times. Uh, and so the more that we can do it on behalf of our clients, the less that we're paying to the Goldman Sachs and um, the JP Morgans um, in, you know, of the world uh, that uh, do fairly well for themselves. And again, BCI, able to, and by legislation, operate on a uh, cost recovery basis. We're not here to generate profits. And again, we're a crown entity. Uh, and so there's a strong alignment with our clients' interests. So turning to the next slide, <coughs> excuse me. It's really just a high level um, reflection of where our investments are. And it, this was part of the transformation as well. But uh, right now, 29% um, of all of our clients' assets are invested in Canada, 41% invested in, in the United States. The um, United States is one of the deepest financial markets, and that's the primary reason for that. Uh, we've got close to 14% in Europe, and then uh, Asia Pacific, about 4%, and emerging markets at about 12%. I suspect emerging markets today is a bit lower than that. Um, and it's an area that we certainly uh, are viewing cautiously. So turning over to the next slide, it, it's really, this just covers uh, the types of investments that your plan, the teacher's pension plan is invested. What you're seeing here is all of our clients' assets, um, if we sort of um, consolidated them. And one of the big themes that I touched on earlier was the fact that public market exposures, so public markets are bonds and stocks that you know we see on the news every day, um, things like the TSX and S&P 500. What the trend has been um, over the 20 years and certainly more recently, we're seeing a decrease in publicly traded uh, securities like bonds and stocks with um, an increase in the private markets, such as real estate, equity, infrastructure, private equity has seen a big increase. And then some of the newer, well, the one new market that's reflected here is private debt, lending directly to companies. The other area that uh, is another private market uh, that's referenced here is real estate debt, that's mortgages, lending um, against property. So that's how um, our current investments are diversified. Now, getting to the point uh, that was made earlier on the next slide, how important are um, investments to your pension plan? And so in terms of the average working life during your career and current active um, members that are working, about 25 uh, cents of um, a future uh, retirement benefit, $1 in payment. Um, so it's basically that $1 of retirement uh, income, 25 of it, 25 cents is paid from contributions, but the bulk of it comes from investment returns, 75 cents out of every dollar uh, that you're receiving is coming from investment returns. 
So a significant contribution, that's how important investment returns are. Um, and then when you think of your duration of your career, on average, an average plan member, um, you know, I'm going to say the number is somewhere in the range. I think of, I'm going to say 26 plus years. Um, and so that's, um, you know, a long horizon that allows for compounding of uh, income and earnings. So that's why um, investments matter so much uh, to pension plans. Now, turning to the next slide, how have we done and how is your plan done? So as I mentioned at the backdrop, um, last year, 2022, was a challenging market. Again, extreme inflation, not quite as bad as the 80s, but certainly the highest uh, inflation that we've seen in many decades. I think it's 40, uh, 40 sorry, four decades, uh, so 40 years. Um, what happened last year and what's reflected here in the minus 3.8 is the fact that Canadian government bonds, Canadian government bonds decreased in value by 11%. And that's purely a function of going from extremely low interest rates uh, to where they're at today at about 5%. Last year, Canadian equities, and this is um, based on calendar year, uh, Canadian equities lost about um, 6%. Global equities, 13%. The good news is that the private market uh, programs that I was talking about actually generated positive returns. So private equity re generated a return of about 5%, real estate, um, 7%, and infrastructure assets, uh, close to 9.5%. So the benefit of having a diversified portfolio certainly pays off during uh, periods of uh, volatility and market strain. What, um, what's more important for a pension plan and an institutional investor, and I'd sort of say all of us as investors, is to focus on the long, longer term. And uh, you can see that over the last five years, uh, the pension plan, teacher's pension plan, has earned 6.7% on an annualized basis, so six points on average, 6.7 per year, relative to a benchmark with the market would have given you of 5.2%. So that means that BCI um, and our investment professionals, as well as some of our external managers that we're using, um, contributed to uh, a, an, an additional uh, return of 1.5%. So that's significant. Jumping to the next slide, uh, and I guess be mindful of time, let's uh, now turn to what is ESG? And um, and maybe even to the next slide, if you don't mind. So ESG is an acronym um, referring to environmental. So things like climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, waste management, water usage. So that's the E. S is social. Things like labor standards, human rights, employee health and safety, supply chain management, community stakeholder relations. And then finally, the G in ESG um, represents governance. And that is things like um, board structure, uh, executive compensation, uh, reporting transparency and disclosure, and including proxy voting. So if we turn to the next slide, there are a number of different approaches to ESG on slide 18, just one more. Can you hear me? So maybe, um, yeah, there it is, thank you. So there are, there are a number of different approaches uh, to investing, um, and maybe I'll start uh, on the left-hand side and work over to the right. So traditional investing is all about maximizing returns uh, and not really considering uh, ESG factors. One column over uh, titled responsible investing, that is including, um, again, maximizing returns for funding pensions uh, and retirement security, 
uh, is what is the key focus, as well as uh, incorporating and evaluating ESG risks and opportunities. And so it's things like incorporating ESG analysis directly uh, into the investment decision making um, is sort of what responsible uh, investing in, including active ownership. And I'll, I'll get into more details about what active ownership is. Um, the next column over uh, there, it's referred to as socially responsible investing. Again, uh, maximizing returns, um, but now introducing some values-based um, inclusionary, what are you gonna want to invest in? And then exclusionary screening uh, based on ESG criteria. So exclusions kind of typically fall into the sin stock type of things, casinos, alcohol, pornography, ammunitions, things like that. Um, we don't do that. That's not part of our responsible investing strategy. And then um, the to the column to the furthest right, impact investing, uh, where it's really about maximizing the positive impact uh, without uh, much regard to the returns that you uh, generate. So given that the pension legislation in the province of British Columbia and the fiduciary standard of care is best financial interest, uh, we really have to focus and trustees have to focus on making sure that we're generating the return to fund uh, pension benefits. And it's all right uh, and absolutely included within fiduciary duty uh, to be considering ESG factors in your decision making. I think where the line um, gets uh, uh, concerning is as um, if we were doing good just for the sake of doing good and not um, focused on generating a return. So collectively, uh, our clients in BCI, we really are squarely in the camp of uh, investing responsibly, incorporating ESG factors, looking to do good while also maximizing returns. So the next slide, actually maybe jump two, is, you know, why... You know, why are we even talking about ESG? Um, because ESG does matter. Um, and I'm just going to quote a couple things, or I'm just going to mention a couple of companies. And I hope that you recognize uh, why they are important and why ESG is important. So Volkswagen, I think we can all recall the emissions scandal. And if I were to throw on the slide, um, a, um, a graph of Volkswagen's share price. I can say that when the scandal broke, um, and you know, we could actually even pull it up, but the share price of Volkswagen dropped considerably. Another uh, example that highlights why ESG matters and a little closer to home, SNC Lavalin, a great Canadian engineering company that got into trouble for bribery and, and corruption. And again, significantly impacted uh, the company's share price and future profits. We can all probably remember BP and the Deepwater Horizon spill back in April, 2010. And again, not a very positive uh, impact on uh, BP's price. And then maybe more recently, Boeing. Um, with the uh, crashes of the 400 max, um, you know, that certainly falls into the social camp and share price for Boeing, have, you know, I don't think it's fully recovered yet. So all that to say that well-managed companies um, that consider uh, and manage environmental, social and governance issues, we expect them to have better profitability uh, and perform better over the long term relative to companies that uh, don't uh, manage things well and don't manage risks well. I just want to take a second um, because in Canada, ESG, um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of debate, maybe maybe a bit of debate with our uh, neighbors uh, to the direct east when it comes to climate change, but just generally in Canada, there is strong support for ESG considerations. I can't say that that's the same circumstance uh, to our neighbors to the South today. 
there is really a um, debate and ESG has become a pretty divisive term strictly from a political perspective. And I'm just thankful we live in Canada that that's not the case. As much as the states are divided um, in terms of the red states and the blue states, what they on ESG and a, a, a range of other things. Um, the one thing that is consistent, though, is that the types of issues that I've mentioned, um, you know, and companies in terms of managing environmental, social and governance, everyone agrees that those are important issues. I think where the debate goes to what end, um, you know, so just a bit of perspective. And again, to my point, things evolve and it's something that we need to be mindful of. So on the next slide, a bit more detail about how we go about um, and what specifically is our ESG strategy. So I'm going to start in the top left, integrate. So we factor in our portfolio managers uh, incorporate ESG factors in their investment decision uh, making criteria. So that's looking at individual companies, ranking those companies on ESG factors relative to others, um, looking at risk perspectives, uh, climate scenario analysis, that type of thing. Uh, and so we're integrating it. Uh, we've got some examples uh, in the next few slides on all of these. Influence is about um, advocating positive impacts and having policy leaders, governments really um, lead on something like climate change, uh, for example. And we also influence companies through our engagement activities. So when we see underperformance um, on an e from an ESG perspective, we engage directly in those com with those companies to improve their performance, improve their conduct. Um, down at the on the left uh, bottom quadrant, you see investing, and so we absolutely do seek opportunities. Uh, to invest directly in ESG-themed um, opportunities. So a couple to mention for you, Global ESG Quant Fund. So we've actually got a dedicated uh, fund that invests primarily on ESG factors. We have another fund that's called the Global Thematic that um, has a very low carbon footprint relative to a broad base of um you know, broad uh, market index. We own dams in Chile as an example, and also companies that are invested in wind, wind turbines, solar panels. And as I mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, we've also invested over uh, $4 billion in sustainable bonds. Just some examples. Um, and then the last pillar of our ESG strategy is really insights. That's about continuous learning, and then sharing those learnings across our organization and that it sort of loops back to so that we're in a position to integrate those considerations into our investment um, decision making. So at a high level, that is our ESG strategy. I've got a couple of examples. There's a reference here that there's further details about our ESG strategy on our website, as well as a very detailed ESG annual report that will give you a lot more information. So just turning over to just some examples, and I've already kind of touched on one on the next slide. Um, how do we integrate? So putting um, these words into actions. So last year, over 260 ESG reviews were completed when looking at investment opportunities. Uh, 38 ESG evaluations of our external managers, making sure that they are uh, utilizing a prudent ESG strategy. And then here's a great example of our real estate uh, manager, Quadril Property Group, being ranked number one in the Americas and number four globally uh, for its global real estate sustainability. Um, so, you know, exceptional um, ranking and result. And we're, we're very proud. Uh, that they, the Quadril team has been able to achieve that. So on the next slide, provide a couple of examples on the influence. Um, so 
what you can see here, I talked about proxy voting earlier. So we voted at over um, 3,000, almost 3,500 shareholder meetings uh, last year, so significant. We've targeted close to 2,300 public companies uh, with our engagement activities, 11 ESG-related policy consultations, roundtables, and joint statements that we participated in. And then Quadrille has made the commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And then jumping to the next um, invest, I think I've already touched some of these. Um, Red and Solar uh, was one of our first uh, investments directly in solar energy. And then you can see the uh, four plus billion in sustainable bonds. Now jumping to slide 25, if you can. Back one, maybe. There we go. Um, our insight. Uh, and so this is about continuous learning uh, and um, evolving our strategy. So we expanded the ESG team uh, and appointed our first global head of ESG, Jennifer Colson, uh, who's been with the organization uh, for over 10 years uh, and absolutely uh, an expert in the area. Uh, we've initiated uh, climate opportunity uh, sector scan. So looking at what is going to be um, the future energy sources that we're all going to utilize. And again, investing early, uh, we hope to A, help with the transition, but B, be able to generate um, significant returns for our clients. And then again, as I said, educate our staff on a range of ESG topics. So the last thing maybe I'll touch on um, is just to say, uh, what is our climate action plan? And so that is on slide 26, the next one. And really what we are committed to um, as um, an investment manager for all of uh, many of uh, BC's public sector funds is really to support the global goal of net zero by 2050. And so we're hoping and we've set some interim um, objectives uh, to have 80% um, of our high admitting companies to have credible uh, climate transition reduction plans in place by 2030. Um, and again, we're going to continue to advocate uh, for climate policies that will help navigate the transition. And you can get uh, a copy of our uh, access, further details about our climate action plan on our website. But again, it is a significant uh, commitment. I talked about uh, incorporating scenario analysis, climate scenario analysis into um, uh, the asset liability studies that uh, our clients like teachers um, undertake every uh, three years or so. And so we are corp incorporating a lot of considerations and factors relating to climate uh, into our investment strategy. So the last slide is really just a high level uh, reflection of um, our uh, contributions and commitments and progress uh, to ESG over our 20 year history. Right. And so know that BCI is recognized in Canada as a leader in ESG. And it's not a new phenomenon. It's something that our founding um, CEO, Doug Pierce, really championed uh, way back when I first started. So um, with that said, maybe I'll just wrap up and say, you know, hopefully um, you've been I've been able to provide a quick overview of who BCI is to provide you uh, some comfort that the teacher's pension plan and your portfolio is in really good shape. Uh, and then obviously how we and our clients approach ESG considerations. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions that might come in. Well, Rob, uh, thank you very much. That's, you know, this is a complex subject. And you presented information in a very reassuring uh, manner to those of us who are obviously very interested in how our pensions are doing. 
I, I found personally that uh, your description of the benefits of your internal management shift where you have in-house uh, uh, investment decision making rather than farming it out and the saving that you have. Uh, I might tell you as an aside and just to bolster that, our, our own uh, association, the BC Retirement Association, we undertook an in-house look at our short-term investments and laddered them and boy the results have been phenomenally beneficial and of course it was an inside a member and he helped us and it was just great so your idea of some years ago has really come to be uh, a benefit. Uh, I do have some questions for you if you've got a moment. Uh, yeah you bet. So first of all <laughs> this, is a, this is a good one I does BCI have a plan to solve BC's housing crisis? You have to think. <laughs> Does the BCI have a plan to help solve the current housing crisis in British Columbia? So, um, okay. So, um, my hopefully. Um, you can hear me. Um, and what I would say is our core purpose is an investment manager. And the housing crisis is, you know, a complex issue. Uh, but I think that the uh, provincial government is taking steps uh, to work with municipalities um, and with um, real estate developers uh, to help address uh, the, the housing need that's here. So, you know, that's the big picture, right? Now, in terms of what is BCI doing and what is Quadreal doing, we do actually have some affordable housing um, within the portfolio. Um, and we're in the midst of, as I think many people, some folks know, if you don't, it's my opportunity to share it, is that Quadreal is constructing a revamping the Oak Ridge um, Mall into not only, you know, refurbishing the mall to an incredible new space um, with a park on top uh, and community space, but actually building um, residential housing around the mall. When, when it's finished, it will be um, this, basically the second center of Vancouver. It's that big. But in that project, I think the number um, of units that they're having to um, make available to the city of Vancouver for affordable housing is something like over 400 units, right? So that, in order to do this project, you know, that was part of the uh, permitting requirements, but you don't generate a return on giving keys to the city of Vancouver other than being able to invest um, and generate, you know, um, some future returns uh, from the other properties. So we have some affordable housing um, within our portfolio through an organization called Park Bridge uh, Land Lease uh, Holdings. Uh, and then um, we do have some um, affordable lower rent uh, in properties as well. But, you know, I guess my key message is that it's not our mandate to use your retirement dollars to fix the housing problem. Well, thank but, you for that. be part of the solution um, where it makes good. Well, it's a problem that isn't going away and it's going to be difficult, but I sure appreciate that we have some small interest in it. That's great. Um, another question does BCI Investment Corporation have investments in Russia or China? Russia, no, um, in the sense that uh, when the invasion happened, uh, Western uh, and international, uh, basically uh, countries uh, globally in large part, banned uh, Russian securities. Uh, and so Russian markets to foreign investors have seized completely. Uh, and so we wrote down our investments to zero. It wasn't a significant amount of money, 
um, across a, a portfolio of um, $233 billion, but we've written down the Russian ex securities to zero. And no, we're not actively trading because we can't. Um, and if we could sell them, we would sell them tomorrow, but we can't. Um, yes, we do have uh, investments in China. Our exposure to China has uh, been decreasing, but the vast majority of it, I think it's less than 5% of assets under management um, in China. And again, most of it is through public equities. Um, and we've been trimming it. And um, yeah, we are concerned a bit uh, about the geopolitical environment um, with China. And so, um, you know, that's something that we're approaching cautiously. The other side of the coin, I mean, maybe two, two additional perspectives to add, um, is that China still is uh, the second largest uh, economy globally. But because of, you know, Xi Jinping, uh, current uh, prime minister, premier, um, he is, uh, you know, I guess his government hasn't really focused on, um, you know, capital market uh, priorities and more um, goals, gov the government's goals. And so as an investor, when um, your companies are being influenced, uh, yeah, obviously not in a good financial way by public policy, that's probably not a place to be invested. So that's the update on China. Not a lot um, and very cautious about China going forward. Oh, good answer. I certainly feel that that, that questionnaire would be uh, has been well responded to. Um, this is a this is a, an interesting one. Can our pe public pension, our public pension, be taken back by the government if they run out of money? So the answer to that is no. Um, and I will refer you to uh, something that happened. Um, was it the 90s? It's called the Seton Inquiry. And um, it might have been, yeah, the 90s. Um, and really, uh, it was a royal commission into what was being argued as a conflict of interest. Um, and Justice Seton uh, looked at, um, we were, our organization used to be uh, directly within government and um, under the Ministry of Finance. And so, you know, that's a little bit closer and a little bit more concerning um, to the question that was raised. But Justice Seaton, in his review and in his Royal Commission, uh, clearly stated out that pension assets are the assets of members they are trust funds. They are, do not belong to the government. And that's sort of why I kind of stressed the uh, the independence of BCI uh, at the beginning. And um, I can understand where that question is coming from in terms of if we look to, again, our neighbors to the east um, and, uh, you know, some aspirations that uh, they, you know, maybe it's in their interest to uh, withdraw uh, from CPP. Um, and again, I think that the, the points that are being raised about security and independence um, of uh, Albertans' retirements is a valid concern. Well, I appreciate your answer. It's reassuring. And I might say it's a, a little impressive to you that the members here are cognizant of things that are happening in the world that affect their pensions and they're asking good questions. I have a, another interesting Absolutely. one for you. Uh, one more, and then any more questions be answered, we'll, we'll send them to you and you can answer back as, as you can. So this is sure. a question about private holdings because private holdings are, are understood to be a big part of uh, recent returns in the investment uh, world of, of our pension. Uh, but they don't have a publicly yeah. traded share price. So how are they valued? Mm, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so they are valued um, at, you know, and it, it, there's a range uh, between real estate, private equity is 
it's the same as publicly traded stocks, except there's no exchange and, you know, it's investors owning a company directly. But for our funds that we manage um, in private markets, we have external appraisers um, produce the uh, valuations. There's a lot of segregation of responsibility. So we've got a big finance team, accountants. Uh, we've got auditors, external auditors. Uh, and then we've got internal controls and a segregation of du um, duties, really to put a lot of rigor around the valuations of private market assets, right? So that they are reliable. Um, they've been audited each year. Every year they get audited. Um, and it's, it is a very important um, question. So, you know, from my perspective and from BCI's perspective, we're following best practice. Um, and I don't think that there's a better way to do valuations. The philosophical side, um, you know, from a philosophical perspective, um, as long as we've got the rigor um, and due diligence around valuations, uh, and that's, you know, best in class and in industry standard, you know, I think that's all that could be expected. The other philosophical perspective is, you know, is all that reflecting the price today? And th the honest answer is we don't know because the only time you know what that asset's worth, sorry for pointing, <laughs> is when we sell it. And then we can say um, with certainty, you know, the accuracy of that value. So, you know, that's a bit of the philosophical kind of perspective is, how much do you spend in terms of process evaluation to get a number, you know, as accurate as possible, but still being subjective, right? So anyway, I think we have a lot of rigor, um, financial uh, audits and controls in place. And so nothing, nothing to be concerned about on the private market valuations. Well, thanks for your candor on that response, uh, not knowing until you sell, but, you know, rigorous looks at the uh, uh, investment portfolio, the private holdings are a confidence builder. Um, so if I can squeeze it just two more, uh, what's the process to divest of fossil fuels? Yeah, you bet. So the process to divest, um, so we don't divest purely um, for environmental, you know, just because, um, you know, just to help climate change per se. Uh, and, you know, maybe I can provide a bit more context around, um, you know, why I'm saying this. So today, global energy demand around the world Fossil fuels um, provide 80, is basically 80% uh, of um, the energy supply globally. So fossil fuels, unfortunately, are going to be with us for a bit. Um, and so we need to find collectively, we need to find alternative energy uh, sources and supplies that are economical. Uh, and viable so that we can get off of um, our reliance on fossil fuels. We all agree that, the, you know, the sooner we can do it, the better. Um, but in the interim, there still is, um, you know, opportunity for energy companies. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, I guess I was going to say shocked, but I shouldn't be shocked with what's going on. You know, the gas prices uh, here in Vancouver, uh, can't believe I'm saying that, but, you know, to 212. Um, there's going to be, um, you know, the opportunity to um, still earn investment income from energy. But absolutely, over time, uh, we need to divest uh, from fossil fuels because um, the company's uh, value will decline when uh, there are alternative uh, energy sources. We're not at that point, 
I'm glad to see EVs and adoption of EVs increase. And I'm told that here in our province, and that's sorry, Metro Vancouver, that um, gas gas consumption has actually declined from over the last year. So that's a positive. So we're looking at what are we doing on to help climate transition? We're looking at investing in renewable energy, um, looking at sort of the next energy supply uh, and making investments in those. Um, and we will divest from an energy company if we think it's overvalued and if we think it's poorly managed. That's how we'll divest. I hope that helps. Oh, good. wonderful. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reassurance happening here. The people are listening. They, that's a that's a real concern. You know, how do you how do you balance the the good returns on your investments? Because as you say, twenty five percent of the pension fund is our contributions, but seventy five percent is the investment returns. So you balance it with the what are you investing in and you know, teachers, we've always had a good uh, ESG uh, attitude, and I sure am pleased with your discussion about how you operate with your ESG investment uh, uh, perceptions and, and, and implement from those perceptions. Uh, okay, honestly, just two more. Is BCI signatory to principles of responsible investing? Absolutely. And um, back to leadership that I talked about, uh, when uh, we release our assessment results, um, so yes, part of being a signatory is you actually have to submit um, a, a question, annual questionnaire each year, and then you get evaluated against um, globally against PRI signatories. And I can tell you uh, and your members that uh, you're well represented by BCI and also the teachers uh, board on that score. Okay, this honest last question. How does the BCI, uh, BC Investment uh, Corporation stay in the tech market gains uh, without taking big losses? For example, like when there's a crash of Twitter, uh, WeWork, or Bitcoin, uh, handling that. So, um, well, that's where active management, that was another major sort of pillar of our transformation. Um, being selective, being conservative, and really buying good companies, uh, and not chasing the latest fad um is really kind of the approaches uh so that we don't get burned and it's you know i can understand where the question's coming from i didn't talk about it at the outset but you know this year equity markets have been doing pretty good um and so the nasdaq year to date uh since january 1 uh to today earlier today it's a positive 25 percent return and that's being driven really by seven mega cap tech companies. Um, we all sort of know their names, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, um, Netflix, uh, Tesla, Meta, which is now the Facebook, right? So those are doing really well in arguably an AI mania. And so that's where the discipline understanding and sorry microsoft is another one um really having um the discipline understanding the companies that you're owning and not chasing uh good companies and rest assured bci never entertained um likely will never entertain because we don't really understand why there's value in crypto um, the only thing that we have considered, and, and you know, I think there's some evolution in this space, is using the blockchain technology, um, you know, for financial transactions in the financial sector. But cryptocurrency is really just a speculation driven by supply and demand, and you have no idea, you know, who's on the other side and what might drive the demand of a cryptocurrency higher. 
Um, and yeah, the folks that are using cryptocurrencies, I should be careful, but <laughs> a good chunk of it um, seems to be illegal activities. Well, I must say, your answers, you know, you're not just a smooth salesman. You have really answered questions in a way that people really understand. Your delivery of answers is, is positive and not simplistic, but understandable. And in a world which we are not really immersed in, uh, it's so nice to have you as a communicator to us. I'd like to thank you for your oh. time. And, you know, I, I had a sheaf of questions here you've answered and much appreciated. So thanks so much for your presentation. Yep. Take care. Oh, yeah. And my, yeah, my sincere pleasure too. Thank you for your time.